Uh, you may have noticed we have our granddaughters with us this morning, and I found it interesting when we were needing to use the hymn books, they all had to be on the right page, even the two that couldn't read or can't read. But having the hymn book was important, so thanks, Carla, for helping them find the page. You could have given them any page, they wouldn't have known the difference. So, oh no, they can't read. So let's uh, pray. Father, I thank you that, uh, for your word. And as we look at it this morning, I pray that you would speak into our hearts. Amen. So this week I heard about a hunter who went out, he was out in the bush hunting, and he got lost. And uh, for three days, he's wandering around out there trying to find his truck, and he, he, he just can't find it. So on the third day, he stumbles into the camp of another hunter, and he's so happy, you know, I've been found. And he, the other hunter says, oh, but he don't get too excited. I've been lost out here for three weeks. <laughs> now, sometimes we can get lost and have a hard time finding our way back. We can lose our way in life. We can lose our way in our relationships. We can lose our way spiritually. And at those times, peace is hard for us to find. Uh, our Advent candle today is about peace. Peace is hard to find, and finding our way back can be hard as well. Now, today we're completing our series that we've been working on on 1 Samuel. And uh, uh, in this story... David loses his way. As a result, he endangers his family. He endangers himself. He endangers everybody who is close to him. He loses his way. He's not at peace with others. He's not at peace with God. He's not at peace with himself. And it takes him a long time to find his way back. Now, in order uh, to give you the background for this story, I'll be covering some of the same passages that uh, Jonathan talked about last week. But let me tell you briefly the story of 1 Samuel, chapters 27 to 31. In these, uh, in these uh, chapters, the story switches back and forth between David and King Saul. And sometimes the events are happen happening at the same time. For exa example, in chapter 30, when David is fighting against the Amalekites and winning, in chapter 31, happening at the same time, King Saul is fighting against the Philistines and losing to the point where he and his sons are actually killed. For today, we're going to focus on the, on the David part of the story. King Saul, by the way, also lost his way. He lost his way with his family. He lost his way with David, with, with God, with God's people. And sadly, uh, King Saul didn't find his way back. So here in the story, here's the story of David in these chapters. Actually, he's going back a little bit. David is a shepherd boy, uh, minding the sheep, not really sticking his nose into anybody else's business. And suddenly, uh, Saul or Sa uh, Samuel, the prophet, comes along and anoints him as the new king of Israel. But there's a problem. The problem is there's an old king, King Saul. At first, uh, David is well received by Saul, but through time, Saul becomes fearful and jealous of David. And so, for years, he tries to kill David. And we know at times, David uh, barely escapes by the, the skin of his teeth. Sometimes, uh, when David has rescued a certain city from, uh, from, the, uh, from various enemies, that city would turn on, on David and betray him and say, Hey, Saul, come look over here. David's hiding here. You can catch him. We'll, we'll, in fact, we'll even help you catch him. And as a result, David was forced to live in the wilderness. And from time to time, Saul and his elite army would march out, chase David down, just about catch him. Their purpose was to kill him. Because he was a threat to King Saul. We know from some of the Psalms that David was close to death on numerous times as, as uh, Saul closed in on him. And so, uh, finally, in chapter 27, verse 1, we read this. 
David kept thinking to himself. Literally, it means uh, he was uh, he was listening to his heart. His heart was talking to him, and his heart was saying, "Someday Saul's going to get me. The best thing I can do is escape to the Philistines. Then Saul will stop hunting for me, and I will finally be safe." So David took his six hundred men and went over and joined the king of Gath. Uh, Gath it was one of the five major Palestinian or Philistine cities. Uh, Philistine was a uh, an empire made up of different kings, small kings, uh, Philistine kings, and they all joined together to make one nation. Uh, Gath was one of the capital cities, and so here you have David moving to uh, a Philistine city. Now, maybe you've been bombarded all week by a secular environment, a place where you work is hostile to faith. You may also be spiritually alone, spiritually lonely, because uh, you have no fellow Christians to talk to. In such situations, you might be tempted to become distracted or pragmatic or even confused. And that's exactly what happened to David. For years... Saul's tenacious pursuit of him had left him exhausted. The constant fear of, is Saul going to get me today? Uh, pressed him down and ground him down to a place of vulnerability. He began to lose contact with the solid things in his life, which reminded him of who he was. David ran from his roots, from the moorings in his life, until he was out of touch with who he was. So, living in a Philistine territory, he decided to join the Philistine army. Why? Why did that happen? Well, once outside of familiar territory, familiar structure, David became a law unto himself. The routine of Hebrew village life was gone. No appointments to keep. No supervisors to, uh, to please, no structures to support, no expectations to meet. David uh, became distant from the people of Judah. And he uh, was hurt and betrayed by them anyhow, by his own people. Now the same thing can happen to us. We get hurt by people in our lives, by those who are closest to us. We lose touch with them. We maybe lose touch with the church. There's no one to be accountable to. And it becomes easy for us to lose our way. In this whole process, David is not just cut off from his roots, but he also becomes out of touch with God. For three chapters that cover the period of 16 months, there's no prayers, no talk on David's lips of God. Uh, there is... Uh, uh, a, a phrase that's often used of, of David is he inquired of the Lord. That doesn't appear in these three chapters. No songs sung, no uh, psalms uh, written. For 16 months, he doesn't mention God at all. His heart and his pen went dry. Have you been there? I have. The result was David made a number of bad choices. Bad choices. First of all, he chose wrong attitudes. He chose to become self-centered and self-protective. He kept thinking to himself. His heart kept saying to him, Someday Saul's going to get me. The best thing I can do is escape to the Philistines. Literally, his heart was speaking into his life. There's no reflection of what's God's will, no reflection on what would be best for God's people. Uh, there's no consideration of God's plan for him and for the people around about him. Rather, his focus is on himself, on saving his own hide, that he might slip away from the hand of Saul. Selfishness and self-thinking lead inevitably to depression and self-pity. One of these days, David lamented, I will be destroyed. Negativism really is a lack of trust in God. His second uh, bad choice was he chose to travel 
into enemy territory. Instead of going deeper and deeper into the heart of Israel, he decided to go deep into the, uh, the country of the enemy. He went towards Gath. He goes to the capital, one of the capital cities. How do you get to the right place by going in the wrong direction? He went to Gath. And eventually, he settled in a city called Ziklag. How quickly we can become attached. Before long, the king of Gath is saying of David, he's going to be my slave for the rest of his life. Wrong attitudes, wrong direction, and finally wrong methods. When David chose, uh, he chose wrong methods. When he, he and his family moved to Ziklag, uh, he led his men in daily uh, raids on people living around about them. Now, who he was really raiding was the Philistine uh, allies and friends, or friends and allies of the Philistines. But he was telling the king of Gath he was raiding the friends and allies of Israel. To cover his tracks, David totally annihilated all the people in these villages, lest one of them go back to Gath and tell the king what he's really doing. So his, his, his methods involved continual deceit and brutal murder. These three choices put David in some deadly, uh, 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 resulted in some deadly consequences for David. Before we get too deep into that, let me tell you the important details of the rest of the story. In chapter 29, or chapter 29 opens with the Philistine army marching against Israel to make war against Israel. And David and his men are marching at the back of the column of the king of Gath and his army. When the other uh, Philistine leaders see David, they say, Whoa, this guy is a hero in Israel. He can't go into battle with us because he might turn on us in the midst of the battle. We don't want him around. Send him away. And so the king of Gath sends David back home. And when he gets home, he finds that the Malachites have raided his village, his town, taken the women, the children, and all the stuff and burned whatever is left. So uh, we see that David and his men weep out loud until it says their strength is gone. They couldn't even weep anymore. At that point, David's men start talking about stoning him, stoning him to death. But then it says, David found strength in the Lord and led his men to chase down the Amalekites. And uh, the short version of the story is they defeat the Amalekites, get their women, children, and all their stuff back, plus a bunch of other stuff as well. And uh, while all this is happening, the army that David was marching in now attacks Israel. And they are victorious against Israel, kill Saul and his, uh, his sons. And the Philistines occupy the villages of Israel. As I said earlier, my focus today is on David's part in the story. So let's note the consequences of David losing his way and moving to Philistine territory. First of all, he endangered the lives of the people who were closest to him. He didn't go by himself. He brought along his, his wife, his wives, and his kids the 600 men with him and their families as well. This ill-advised decision placed many people in jeopardy. And then while he's marching with the Philistines, the Amalekites came and took his, his wife and his, their children and uh, all the, the families of his men all as slaves. Now, the Amalekites were known uh, as a very brutal and violent people. And that will mean that the women and children would have been ravished and abused. Fatal decisions are never completely our own business. Even more significantly, David placed this whole group of people in spiritual jeopardy. The Israelites always were attracted to the sensational or sensual and idolatrous, idolatrous uh, culture of the Philistines. 
And so David placed them at spiritual peril. In addition, by choosing his, his uh, way of, of leading, his, his uh, daily lies and violence and self-trust, David was uh, showing an example of all the wrong things. He was modeling all the wrong things for his people. Sinful ways are contagious and have deadly fallout even upon the innocent. While we may be, uh, feel that we are alone, we never sin alone. The chain reaction of consequences endangers many people around about us. So first of all, David uh, uh, endangered the lives of the people around about him. Secondly, he lost his credibility and spiritual authority. He neutralized his own witness. Even the king of Gath saw David as one who had become odious to his people, to his own people. Uh, David was so stripped of his credibility that his men started talking about stoning him to death. Our lives are not totally our own business. But worst of all, the third thing, David seemed at times to have so blurred the lines that he became confused about who he was, about his own identity. He attempted to be Philistine on the outside and Israelite on the inside. The bottom line, however, was David found himself marching in the army of the Philistines on their way to attack Israel, to attack his own people. What was he thinking as his feet slowly marched towards Israel? Was he looking for an opportunity to cut and run? Was he hoping that the other uh, uh, Philistine leaders would say, oh, no, no, David can't be part of our army. We need to set him home, send him home. Was he finally ready to attack Saul and destroy Saul? Or was he planning to mutiny on the Philistines and the heat of the battle turn on them? Probably he was so confused and trapped that he thought about all of these things. He'd lived with deception and without spiritual context and accountability for so long that he wasn't sure about who he was anymore. Which side was David on? Now there's an old U.S. Civil War legend about General uh, Sherman. Um, as he was making his march uh, towards the sea, somewhere in Georgia, uh, out from behind a rural smoke shed, a little old lady jumped out in front of him on his horse. He's on his horse. She jumps out from behind this shed uh, with a broom in her hand and her bony little fingers. Dixie fire she's got blazing in her eyes and she plants her feet. And Sherman hesitated for a moment but then spurred his horse on around her. But she would have none of it. She attacked him as viciously as she could with her broom, swinging wildly. But it didn't take long, and she ran out of breath, and she had to stop. And he, he's kind of amused, and he says to her, uh, Lady, you must realize I'm a general on a horse. I have a whole army right behind me, and you're just a little old lady on foot. All you got is a broom. Surely you realize you have no hope of defeating me or even slowing me down, really. And she says, ah, oh, shucks, son, I know all that. I just wanted to make clear that uh, uh, I wanted everyone to understand clearly on which side I am. David wasn't sure what side he was on. The trouble with wanting to be worldly wise on the outside and Christian on the inside is no one quite understands for sure where we stand. Eventually, you're not even sure yourself. Am I Philistine or am I Israelite? For three chapters, for 16 months, David was in a far country looking and acting like a Philistine. The whole thing finally came crashing down on him. With his family taken as prisoners, with his men on the brink of stoning him to death, David returns to his disciplines that he's, uh, 
to the disciplined pattern of his life. He found strength in the Lord. This is uh, 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. David was now in great danger because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters. They began to talk of stoning him. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Back in verse 4, it had said that David and his men had run out of strength because of their grief. They were wailing and weeping until they had no strength left. Where David's strength failed, God's strength takes over. Now, what in practice did David do? When it says he found strength in the Lord, what does that look like practically? How did he go about doing that? Now, this passage doesn't tell us exactly what he did, but the Psalms give us a clue. David wrote many of the Psalms, and many of his Psalms have a pattern. The the Psalm begins with some kind of despair or, or disheartedness, disillusionment. And then the Psalm continues, and basically it's a sermon to himself. It's reminding him of who God is and what God has done. And the result is that fear turns to faith and pain turns to praise. Back in 27 verse 1, David let his heart speak and he found despair. His heart was saying, I got to get out of here. One of these days Saul's going to catch up to me and kill me. He allows his heart to speak And he finds despair. Now, David speaks to his heart and finds strength. As a result, David begins to bounce back and he takes three specific actions. First of all, he reestablishes contact with God. During his uh, his spiritual sabbatical, God had been set to the sidelines and David's strength had drained away. Now his strength is revived Once more, he begins to call upon the Lord. Verse uh, 7 and 8 say, Then David said to the priest, Bring me the ephod. And David inquired of the Lord. This was long overdue. The Lord had not led him into Philistine territory. When we find ourselves in a faraway country, out of touch and out of control, the first step, the first step always, is to reopen communication with God. Get back to the basics. Get back to talking to God. No matter what the circumstances are or how dark and bleak the situation is, the first priority is to inquire of the Lord, to get back in touch. Before things uh, spin more and more hopelessly out of control, once David had reestablished his communication with God, he could make some other Uh, clear-minded decisions and clear-minded actions. The second thing he did is he reestablished relationship with God's people. After his battle with the Amalekites, he had a huge uh, amount of of plunders, uh, spoils from the war. And so he took some of that and sent it as gifts to the elders of of Judah. This put him back uh, inside the structure restoring order into his life. He now had a group that he was once again accountable to. Finding ourselves again after we've been lost demands getting involved once again with an organized group of believers. A church, a small group, an accountability group, something. Re-establish contact with God's people. Thirdly, David resumed his role as leader appointed by God. He got back into business. He mobilized his 600 men. He set out in pursuit of the Amalekites. When when the victory was won and he's on his way back, he took the troublemakers and set them straight there. There was, uh, what had happened was of the 600, 200 stayed behind because they were tired. And when the 400, they didn't want to share the spoils with the 200. And David said, no, no, no. Well, we're all sharing this equally, evenly. David had lost his way, and in the process, he began to look more like Saul than like David. But now he recovered his his kingly behavior and his identity, and he was ready for the throne that was left empty by Saul's death. 
Now, this story of David gives us or leaves us with three very clear principles. Now, I haven't talked about these things directly, but as I lay them out for you, if you've been following the story, uh, they should be clear. The first one is, uh, there's three. The first one is this, our rootlessness, uh, being lost, being away from the structures and the the moorings of our life, leaves us vulnerable to self-deception. In his heart, David became disconnected from God and from God's people. As a result, in chapter 21, or 27, verse 1, he allowed his heart to speak lies into his life. He didn't even recognize the lies. When we get disconnected, when we are rootless, our hearts can deceive us, can speak lies into our lives and we don't even recognize it. Secondly, a consistently violated conscience leads to a confused identity. David continually violated what he knew was right until he wasn't sure anymore. Am I a Philistine or is, am I an Israelite? And third, God's forgiveness and strength are always available when we choose to come back home. There's a homeland that you belong to. And it's up to each one of us to decide if we're in it or not. If you're wandering in a strange land, why not come home? When you feel you've lost your way, you've lost your identity, remember, God is always waiting to welcome you home. Let's pray. Father, uh, as we've uh, studied the life of uh, David, we are thankful for uh, the examples that, or the, the pictures that he has given to us about Jesus. But in this passage, we see he lost his way. It can hap- if it can happen to him, it can happen to us. I thank you that you, provi- you always provide a way back. So for, for us, where we've been wandering, we want to come back to you. We want that peace that uh, we talked about in the, when we lit the candle. I pray that we, you would empower us to reconnect with you, to reconnect with the important people, the spiritual people in our lives, and, uh, and, and then start to uh, live in, in those new, that new uh, um, foundation in our lives. We pray this in the name of Christ.